So there's one question I've been getting a lot more in my comments on this channel, and that is from beginners, maybe they're juniors or people trying to break into the industry, and they're questioning what should I learn and how should I learn with like the advent of AI? Because right now with the AI tools, like you have Cursor, you have Cloud Code, Codex, like they just came out with new tools and the models just keep getting better. And it can be a confusing landscape to navigate because like how do you know when you should be prompting the AI versus when you should just go and code it by hand? And I'll try to hit on some of these points in this video, but again, these are just my opinions. So to become a software engineer, you need to know how to build software. How do you build software where you have to have a vision of a user interface or an application and you need to be able to plan out how that's going to work so for example with automaker we've been working on our discord channel we knew that we wanted like the ability to add in git work trees so you have to start with a vision and then typically when you're trying to learn how to code you have to take a larger component and figure out ways to break it down into smaller subcomponents because even this work tree thing this has a branch you can select a different branch here you can go and switch over the different work trees you can delete all these you can pull changes there's a lot of features that go into this whole work tree thing and often an application is basically just composed of a bunch of different sub modules that you have to basically understand how you build individually so as a beginner your goal should be able to look at any component on a page and say yeah i could build that right so for example, you have a button. Inside the button, you have some icon and you have some text, it's center. Can you style that by hand? Do you know the correct CSS layout, whether that's Flexbox or Grid, how to do align items, justify content, all these different things. Like, do you actually know how to center this thing? And once you do figure it out, then you can start leveraging AI to kind of do that tedious stuff for you. Because I have spent a lot of years like learning how to do layouts in a UI, and it just reached a point where it's like, this is very tedious stuff. I don't want to have to write CSS. It doesn't matter. It's like such low hanging fruit, tedious coding. And if I can leverage an AI to write the tail in CSS to lay out these columns for me, I would probably just rather do that. But I do think there is a value in fundamentally understanding how you could actually build this out by hand. How could you create a row that has four columns laid out like this? How could you create a header in those columns? How could you create buttons? And when you click them, they show modals. These are things that you want as a beginner to code at least once by hand, in my opinion. And then once you kind of get the gist of it, you then can leverage AI tools to basically just one shot them in your application. Again, this talk is all for people who actually want to become coders. This is not a talk for Vibe coders. Vibe coders are people who just don't look at the code. They kind of just ship features and it doesn't matter. Now we might reach a point where AI is good enough where like you don't even ever have to look at the code, but I have used these LLMs long enough and I've read through the code that they output if you are not very meticulous in how you craft and prompt the LLMs, they are going to generate sloppy code. There's going to be magic numbers everywhere. There's going to be places where it duplicated an entire piece of code from one place of your application to another place. And so there are problems with using LLMs to just code up your entire application. And eventually you get to the point where you have to keep prompting more and the LLM has to take longer loading files. Like, like for example, even an automaker at one point, this board view was like a thousand lines long or like 2000 lines long. Right. And so, if you don't go through and read the code and realize, okay, this is probably something that needs to be refactored, how would you ever know to prompt the LLM to do it? So this topic kind of leads me to the next point, which is clean code practices in design patterns. So when you get into software engineering, there are a lot of different design patterns that you can add into your code base that make the code more decoupled, extendable, modular, just so it's cleaner so that you can easily come through and just change it or add in new features in the future and not have to go and refactor a bunch of code. So I would recommend if you are a beginner, the thing you should be doing is maybe getting a couple books, like maybe the Clean Code uh, book from Uncle Bob, the Clean Architecture. You should go through here and learn the Gang of Four Design Patterns. And even if you're not doing object-oriented programming, at least understanding what these things are, like an abstract factory, a builder. Now, the reason I recommend going through these is because if you understand what these are at a high level and at least try to implement one yourself with code, like manually write this stuff up by hand once so that you understand like the purpose of it. And this is useful because even like, for example, this object pool, I was building a game and I have a web server. The web server has to run like 30 times a second and it has to create a bunch of objects, new zombies, new bullets, new players as they move around the map, new items. And at some point you create so many objects over and over again that the node garbage collection kicks in and the entire server kind of locks up for 60 milliseconds. Now, I already knew that there's something called an object pool that you can use to basically reduce the amount of memory the runtime has to allocate all the time. Right. And so knowing about the thing allows you to go to cursor and prompt cursor and say, hey, I want you to refactor my server to actually use an object pool when bullets and entities and items are created so that we're not using a ton of memory and the garbage collector doesn't come through and lock up my server. 
And so it can give it a bunch of context and typically Cursor or Opus 4.5 can just knock out the feature. So that would be my recommendation is go through and make sure you kind of understand how to implement these and what they do and why they could be useful because when you're doing agent decoding and trying to build out applications, you can sometimes add those to your prompt and the AI just knows exactly what you're looking for. Other things like the clean code I talked about, I have seen, like I mentioned, AI write a bunch of sloppy code. I've seen it copy and paste magic numbers all throughout the code base. I've seen it hard code strings. And if you don't do your due diligence to like go back through and prompt the LLM again to like go through and refactor your code, it's just gonna leave a bunch of this stuff all over your code base. And I have seen this in practice when you keep adding bad code to your code base, if you go and prompt the LLM to add a new feature or fix a bug, it ends up fixing the bug just in that location. But then you go and you check out another page and the exact same bug exists there. And then you go and you open a modal and you try something else and that ex exact same bug exists there. So the bug is like existing in five different places in your code base, but because you didn't go through the code and refactor it to make it more you know, abstract and have one centralized place where that thing lived, now it lives five or six different places in your code base. And the LLM basically, you just keep prompting it and you keep prompting it. And you're like, okay, I'm not getting any solutions because uh, the code is just written poorly. So again, my point is like, you need to know what you're prompting and you need to review the code. Now, I won't lie to you. I do say that on agentic coding is the gold standard in my opinion, but sometimes I do vibe code. Sometimes if the feature is so low risk and low importance, I will just vibe code a solution because I just want it to work, right? If you find yourself wasting a bunch of time as a beginner trying to, you know, get past a roadblock, let's say you're trying to spin up your first Express application or your first Hono app, and you're sitting there for hours because you just misconfigured something or you typed in the wrong syntax or you're passing the wrong property into a function and you can't debug it, these are things that honestly, they're just wastes of time, right? Instead of spending three or four hours trying to debug the most simplest bug, which ends up being one line, you could just let the LLM fix it for you and then review the code. So as a beginner, you should probably be reviewing and reading every single output that the LLM explains to you. Typically when you're asking it to add features or fix bugs, it gives you a full breakdown. How did this fix the bug? What was the bug in the first place? If you don't know these things, and you're not asking these questions, you are not gonna make it. Like you need to make sure you're proactive and understanding how the system is set up What's causing these bugs? How do you fix these bugs? How do you prevent these bugs in the future by writing cleaner code? And those are kind of your goals as a beginner. Now, like I said, there's low risk code. Like for example, if I wanted to add a little button over here that adds a, shows a modal, that's low risk. I really don't care. The only thing I would care about is to make sure that the modal that pops up was actually abstracted out to a reusable component so that if I have other modals in my application, they are gonna use the same type of design especially the same tailwind designs, the same theme colors. Because if you don't do this, this is another thing that I've seen with doing like vibe coding. If you don't prompt it to do this, what ends up happening is that you're not gonna be able to create a feature like this, where you can easily swap out the entire theme of your application because you did not tell it from the get go, hey, all the styles, make sure they're like located in a global CSS and you have CSS variables that are properly set up so you can quickly switch out your themes. If you don't prompt it and you don't look through the code and see that it's just hard coding colors all throughout your code base, you're not gonna know to go and refactor that. So again, as a beginner, your goal should be try to build stuff yourself. Try to review the code. Try to learn these higher level design patterns, your clean code books, your clean architecture books. And then even past this, I mean, this is just related to code, but like there's system level architecture books that you can read as well. There's different, there's stuff like cues and there's stuff like topics and there's stuff like exponential fallbacks with retries, right? So there's, there's a bunch of terminology that you end up needing to learn because it makes you a better software engineer. So your goal right now, honestly, the most important thing you probably do is just read. You need to read, you need to learn, you need to read. Even when it comes to libraries and frameworks, like don't just prompt your way to a solution. If you're using Next.js, go to the Next.js docs and read through them. Make sure you have a high level understanding of how it works. What is a server component? What is server side rendering? What is hydration? These, these are terms that if you do not truly understand when your app breaks and you see that error, you get into the habit of just copying, pasting it over here and letting the LM fix it. And then you try again when it fails. And then you try again when it fails. And you keep trying and you're like, oh man, AI sucks. No, it's because you have no idea what you're doing. AI is actually pretty powerful when you can throw in the right key terms and you have a decent understanding of what a hydration error actually means in Next.js. And then you can take the code that's causing the hydration error and you can paste it in here and you can give it additional context of, hey, I'm pretty sure this is a hydration error. I want you to go and look up the Next.js documentations of how React server components kind of work with data fetching and see if you can maybe refactor that hydration error and remove it. So there's things that you can throw into your prompt to make it more successful. And I do think using LLMs in this day and age, the code is very important. Just don't over leverage it as a beginner and also don't waste 
five hours trying to fix a hydration error in Next.js because who cares? Get off of Next.js. It sucks anyway. Go to Tanstack Start. Because wasting your time fixing that type of bug is such a time sink and it provides very little value to you, right? There are some bugs that are important to solve. But something like a hydration error, something like a simple syntax error, something like you passed in the wrong argument. You, like you don't want to find yourself wasting four hours fixing these. So another thing I want to stress as a beginner, something that you're going to end up needing to learn how to do pretty fast is reviewing code. So when you're using LLMs and everyone's basically using LLMs to generate code these days, it's going to create a lot of code and you need to read through the code to at least understand at a high level, what is it doing? Try to identify spots that might have security issues. Try to identify spots that might have performance issues. For example, let's say you're doing an await inside of a for loop. Maybe that's something that you can identify and say, you know what, this should be a promise all or a promise all settled that we're going to await instead because it's a little bit more efficient. Also, when you start working on one project for a very long time, you'll start to see that it grows in size. You get a bunch of different files. You get a ton of code. You need to understand as a beginner, how can I navigate this code? Because you will reach a point with an LLM, like if you're trying to just code your way to a solution, it will not be able to figure out the answer. Maybe in the future, you know, we'll have Opus 8 and it can just solve any of our problems. But the current state of LLMs from what I've seen, sometimes it cannot solve the problem and you find yourself just sitting there prompting it over and over again, hoping and crossing your fingers that it will eventually solve the problem that you're trying to get it to solve and it never does until you go through and actually start giving it specific context and debugging yourself. I've seen this all when using LLMs, right? I do end up having to come through and I do have to give it context and I do have to make sure it's guided in the right direction. And so when I say understanding and be able to navigate a larger code base, what do I mean? So for example, if I brought you onto this project to work on Automaker and I said, hey, I need you to add a, a feature to the work trees that we added up here. Do you even know how to find where this component is in the code base? It should be something that you can do in five seconds, right? If you actually understand your code base, you should be able to find any component in like five seconds. So go over here, type work tree panel. Okay, I found it. Here it is. And then this panel is broken up into a work trees tab. We got a button for adding a work tree. We got a button for refreshing. So it looks like I've already uh, found my bearings. Here's the tabs. Here's the add button. Here's the refresh. That is where you want to end up getting as a beginner. You want to find a way to work in a larger code base, learn how to navigate it, learn how to understand where these components basically live and be able to come through and modify this stuff. That's the end game, right? That's the goal. And then the cherry on top is all the additional design patterns that I talked about, the system levels architecture that eventually you have to learn if you want to become like a DevOps engineer again to designing stuff in AWS. And then also the security stuff if you want to maybe become a security engineer. So I know this is a long talk and hopefully there's some piece of information I gave that you found kind of useful. I will say that it's not easy. I think that right now it's going to be very hard to navigate this software engineering uh, landscape right now. Like there's for example, even getting a job, there's some companies that are asking you to use AI and then they're going to judge you based on how well you use AI. There's going to be companies that don't want you to use AI. There's companies right now that don't even allow people to use AI. So it's very challenging. And if you get an interview where they're asking you to use AI, you feel like you're getting judged because you're asking too many questions. You're like, oh man, if I ask about this, are they going to think I'm an idiot? Yeah, they might. And it, it just kind of sucks because you are basically allowed to use these tools and these tools are so good that most of the time, any question that they ask you, like if they ask you a FizzBuzz question, like you should just be able to use Opus and implement it for you. Which is why I say you should have a decent understanding of using LLMs in your day-to-day -day workflow because I think it's just going to get more uh, prevalent in the interviewing scene where they're going to ask you to basically code something and they're going to say, use whatever tool that you want. And they're going to see what are your first instincts are. Your first instincts are to go and reach to Composer. Do you maybe plan stuff out in an MD file first to make sure you understand what's going on? Do you gather all your requirements and throw that into an LLM and have that modify your code? Do you even understand or review the code that the LLM is generating? Overall, there's no silver bullet. I think it's going to be hard to become a software engineer now. Uh, like you have all these tools that basically do the work for you. You have the ability to become extremely lazy and not actually review the code. You can just prompt your way to a working solution and people are going to be happy that there's features out there. But at the end of the day, if you want to become a software engineer, you need to have a deeper understanding um, of all these high level ideas. And then I guess one last thing I'll talk about is having a deeper understanding of the things that you're using. So for example, if you're building an application in TypeScript in Node, you should probably know a little bit about the Node runtime. You should probably know a little bit about how the event loop kind of works in Node, right? So just dive a little bit deeper and make sure you truly understand some of that stuff. Now, some people, like for an interview, they might ask you to dive super deep. I, I've, I've seen this myself. They ask you questions that literally do not mean anything. 
it's almost like they're just asking the questions as an ego trip. Like they're just trying to see like, what are you good at? And it's like, oh, I knew that. And he didn't, the person I'm interviewing didn't know that. It's like, okay, well, how does this thing actually help me in the job? It doesn't, it, it really doesn't. So the whole interviewing process, in my opinion, is kind of broken. But diving a little bit deeper and understanding how Node.js works, how does TypeScript kind of work, understanding how to write your types, understanding how to configure, for example, your TS config file a little bit. Like is TypeScript an interpreted or a compiled language? So these things are good if you keep diving down the rabbit hole and really expanding your knowledge. I think it's just gonna make you a much better engineer. And again, don't forget, you have this LLM over here. So you can literally ask questions to this all day long and tell it to explain to you how a TS config file is set up. Have it explain to you how type annotations are set up. What are generic types in TypeScript? You know, what? how does the node event loop? A lot of the stuff that we used to reach out to videos to have people teach us, you don't need it anymore. You just need an LM to walk you through. And if it's too confusing, you prompt the LLM and say, hey, explain it to me like I'm 15. And if that's still too confusing, say, hey, explain it to me like I'm five. Okay, you can break down the problem into smaller baby spoon feedings for yourself if you need to. And don't forget that you can do that. Hopefully this video is kind of useful. Have a good day and happy coding.